Young and undamaged RMSA improves the health span and lifespan of mice. So first, what is RMSA? So that stands for recombinant mouse serum albumin. So the mouse isoform of albumin, a protein that is located in the blood, was expressed and then purified from the yeast Pecia pastoris. That albumin was then injected into C57 black six mice. So starting from 12 uh, month old mice, albumin or saline as a control was injected every three weeks until death. And then as I noted in the title of this paper, uh, lifespan was extended. So let's see that data. So we've got the data for the female and mice, so percent survival on the y-axis for the uh, male and female mice on the left, and then the individual data for the female and then male mice. So first, starting with the data for the female and male mice, we can see uh, average lifespan in the saline injected mice, the controls was about 19 months. That was then significantly extended in the albumin injected mice. Now that effect was also true whether looking at only the female mice and only the male mice. As we can see first with the female mice, we, we've got the average lifespan for the saline injected mice. And then we see the significant extension of lifespan in the albumin injected mice. And then we also see that effect in the male mice. Now, this is a, about a 19% increase in average lifespan. For, so for an 80 year average lifespan of people, a 19% increase is about 15 years, which is pretty big, pretty big gain in, in lifespan. All right, now I mentioned that health span was also improved in albumin injected mice. Uh, so what does that entail? So muscle mass and strength, spatial learning and memory, and phosphorylated tau. And I'm going to go through all of that data in the upcoming slides. And then I'm also going to talk about how is albumin potentially impacting health span and lifespan? What's the mechanism for these effects? So first, in terms of health span related measures that were improved in albumin treated mice, uh, they looked at uh, muscle strength. Uh, so as, as we can see for the data for the female mice on the left, the male mice on the right, we can see higher levels of grip strength in the albumin injected mice when compared with controls, saline injected mice. And I should mention uh, uh, these data were for, 12, for, for an eight month study from uh, when the mice were 12 months old until 20 months of age. Again, they were injected uh, once every three weeks with albumin or saline, so two separate groups of mice. So what about muscle mass? Now, uh, although we see trends for the female mice on the left and the male mice on the right for higher levels of muscle mass, and in, in this case, they measured the gastrocnemius mass, which is uh, arrowed in green, which is a, you know, the largest muscle in the, uh, in the calf. So although we see trends for higher muscle mass in the female and male mice, those effects were not statistically significant. But note how many dots there are, which each dot corresponds to muscle mass in an individual mouse. It's possible that the sample sizes that they used to uh, explore whether these were significant effects or not, were not weren't large enough to detect this as a potentially statistically significant effect. So to uh, account for that, they looked at the combined data for males and females in the albumin injected mice, RMSA, versus the saline injected mice as it controls. And now we can see that there is indeed a significant increase in muscle mass in the albumin injected mice when compared with controls. Now, there was also improved cognitive ability in the albumin injected mice. And the assessment for cog co cognitive ability that they used was the Barnes maze. Now, as you can see by that disc for the Barnes, ma Barnes maze, there are many holes or many ways for the mouse to uh, escape. But the actual escape, as highlighted there, there's only one actual escape. So the mice are trained to find the escape. And then at a later point, they put the mouse back on the maze and see uh, if they can actually find the escape, how many of the mice are actually able to find the escape, and then how long did it take? So in terms of uh, the ability of the mice to find the escape, we can see that the albumin injected mice, a significantly higher fraction of those mice were able to find it relative to the saline injected controls. And then also the, the saline, uh, when compared with the saline uh, injected controls, who took a relatively longer time to find the escape, we can see that the albumin injected mice found it faster. So from this, we can conclude that there's improved spatial learning and memory in the albumin treated mice. Now, there was also reduced levels of phosphorylated tau in the brains of albumin injected mice. So why is tau important? So this is a, a, a scheme of uh, microtubules in a neuron and uh, the pathology as it relates to uh, Alzheimer's disease and neuro neurofibrillary, neuro neurofibrillary tangles, sorry. So first, uh, in the normal situation, Tau stabilizes uh, microtubules, so uh, tau being the protein as indicated by the red shapes. But then where there, when there is kinase activation, kinase phosphorylates tau, and in the case where there is kinase overactivation, tau is hyperphosphorylated, which leads to microtubule depoly depolymerization. So you see portions of the microtubule disassociating from the bigger, larger microtubule. 
And when that happens, when tau is hyperphosphorylated, that causes it to lose normal physio physiological function, to gain toxicity, and to aggregate, thereby forming those neurofibrillary tangles, which then accumulate in neurons, causing neuronal death, and then that activates microglia, which then leads to progressive neuronal da uh, damage. Now, this is a part of the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. So what were the levels of P-tau, so phosphorylated tau, in the brains from saline treated when compared with albumin treated mice? So first, when looking at the data for males, females, and then males and females together, we can see that the male mice that were injected with saline had significantly lower levels of phosphorylated tau in the brain. We see a trend but not significant in the female mice. And again, sample size may not have been enough for whatever reason to detect this as a significant effect. We see they only looked at 11 total mice, six for the saline, five for the albumin injected. And then when looking at both the male and female mice within albumin injected versus the saline injected, we can see that now there is a significant reduction in phosphorylated uh, levels of tau in the, in the albumin injected mice. So with this in mind, uh, a question that comes to my mind is could albumin injections improve Alzheimer's disease-related pathology in people? And there aren't any studies for that yet. Uh, so hopefully there will be. Now, although it's not directly related to health span, we can see that albumin-treated mice have glossier and thicker fur. So when looking at representative mice uh, for, that were saline injected, we can see uh, you know, poor hair quality, some hair loss in the female mice on the left, and then a little bit of hair loss uh, in the, in, uh, on the right for the saline treated mice. But then when comparing the albumin injected mice, we can see that the, the hair coats look tremendously better, very little hair loss um, uh, for both the male and female mice. So uh, with all of this data in mind, what's the mechanism? How are albumin injections impacting health span related characteristics and lifespan? So as a first assessment, uh, we, they looked at body weight, and body weight was not different when comparing the albumin treated when compared with the saline treated mice. So the data for the males are on the top, and the data for the females for body weight are on the bottom. And we can see overlapping uh, data for both the saline injected and albumin injected. So we can conclude that body weight wasn't different between the groups. Now, that's important uh, because uh, it, it potentially rules out that calorie restriction wasn't involved in these health and longevity promoting effects. Now, although food intake wasn't reported because body weight was the same, we can assume that cal there wasn't a mild calorie restriction in the, albu in the albumin injected mice, which can account for those effects. All right, now uh, I've presented this data before. Albumin decreases with aging, and this is data in humans. It's more than, uh, including more than a million subjects, and we can see the clear decrease in albumin levels from youth uh, all the way up to about 100 years. So with that in mind, were blood levels of albumin increased in the albumin-treated mice as a potential uh, explanation for these uh, improvements in health span and lifespan? So this is the albumin data starting from the uh, albumin injection at day zero, and then over the 21 days after the injection prior to the next injection. And they looked at albumin levels on the y-axis for two different doses of albumin, for 20 milligrams in blue and 50 milligrams in red. And for the most part, it's stable. Albumin levels didn't, with the exception of a two-day period of the 21-day period, albumin levels are pretty stable throughout that period. Uh, so uh, from this, we can conclude that the albumin injections did not reverse the age-related decline for albumin. In contrast, the albumin that they injected into the mice was young and less damaged than endogenous albumin. So let's have a look at that data. So our MSA, so the albumin that, that was injected, had more free thiols, uh, similar levels of protein carbonyls, less homocysteine, and more age products, uh, adducts, when compared with endogenous albumin. So first, let's, let's walk through these data. So free thiols, what is that? So uh, uh, thiols are, are the sulfhydryl group, so SH, and, and that's when they're reduced, in the reduced form on the left. But in the presence of oxidative stress, those sulfhydryls become oxidized, therefore, thereby forming a disulfide bridge, and you lose the two free thiols. So free thiols can be used as an index of oxidative stress. So what did they find when comparing the albumin injected versus the saline uh, injected mice? So that's what we're looking at here, relative levels of free thiols. And, and note that we've got the, uh, the RMSA, so that's the uh, albumin that was injected, and then the endogenous levels of albumin that were found in one-month-old mice, 12-month-old mice, and 20-month-old mice. So first note that there is an age-related decrease for free thiols in the mice. And that's not a surprise because oxidative stress increases during aging, so you'd expect to see a loss of thiols uh, during aging. And this is thiol levels in albumin. In contrast, look at the levels of, of uh, free thiols in the uh, albumin that was injected into the mice. It has higher levels of free thiols, which suggests a lower level of oxidatively uh, damaged uh, albumin. Now, they also looked at protein carbonyls as uh, an, a second index of oxidative stress. 
So just as a quick intro for what that actually means, using the amino acid threonine, which has a hydroxyl group, OH, in the presence of oxidative stress, that hydroxyl group becomes oxidized, uh, thereby allowing for the formation of a protein carbonyl, which is character characterized by a C double bonded to O, oxygen. So what did they see in this study? So first they saw that protein carbonyls in albumin uh, increased during aging in the mice from 1.5 to 12 to 20 month old mice, which again, shouldn't be a surprise because oxidative stress increases during aging. And then the carbonyls that were in the uh, albumin that was injected into the mice had similar levels to endogenous levels of albumin, we can see. So they've got basically youthful levels of carbonyls, so they've got really low levels or relatively low levels of oxidative damage to their albumin, at least based on protein carbonyls. Now, notice that uh, they also had less homocysteine bound to albumin. So not only can free thiols be oxidized, they can also be homocysteinylated. And that's what we can see here. So starting with a protein thiol, in the presence of homocysteine, uh, they react, the sulfhydryls of those two react uh, under a process that's known as S-homocysteinylation. Uh, and then we can see that the free thiols for both are lost, now forming a disulfide linkage between the protein uh, sulfur with the uh, sulfhydryl of homocysteine. So in terms of the levels of homocysteine that were bound to albumin, first in the mice, we can see that that increases during aging, which also shouldn't be a surprise because homocysteine levels increase during aging. And I have a video on, on homocysteine levels during aging. So if you missed that, it'll be in the right corner. You can check it out if you like. Now, in contrast, the uh, albumin that was injected into the mice had even lower levels of homocysteine bound to it as shown there. And that's when compared to the really young mice that were only one and a half months old. So it's less homocysteine, homocysteinylated. It's got less of that bound to albumin. Now of the fourth uh, adduct that they looked at was age products in albumin or age product adducts. So what does that mean? So uh, age products are advanced glycation end products, which by definition are proteins or, or lipids that become glycated as a result of exposure to high levels of sugar, sugars. So just as the example, I've got albumin as shown here, and with its uh, amino group NH, that forms a chemical bond with uh, a sugar. In this case, I've got fructose uh, shown here. So that combination of fructose bound to albumin is an advanced glycation end product because it's a protein that's been uh, chemically modified by sugar. So how do age product adducts in the albumin that was injected into this mice, into these mice, compare against young levels of albumin and how does it change during aging? So sim a similar trend, we can see that uh, age product adducts in albumin, endogenous albumin in the mice increased during aging. And then in contrast, the albumin that was injected into the mice had lower levels of uh, glycation. So less glycated albumin in the albumin that they injected into this mice. So in sum, the, the albumin that was injected into the mice was young and less damaged based on these metrics, including less oxidized, less glycated, and less homocysteinylated. So with that in mind, is the young and less damaged albumin responsible for these health span and lifespan uh, related improvements in the albumin injected mice? So the one way to explore that hypothesis is by comparing damage to albumin in the mice that were injected with the uh, RMSA versus damage to albumin in the mice that were only injected in saline. And that's what we can see here. So when looking at those various metrics of damage to albumin and comparing the tw in 20 month old mice that were uh, given albumin injections every three weeks versus mice that were given saline injections every three weeks, we can see that the albumin injected mice, uh, the albumin in the albumin injected mice had lower levels of carbonyls, lower levels of glycation, lower levels of homocysteine bound to albumin. Now, free thiols weren't different though when comparing the albumin in the albumin injected mice versus the albumin in the saline injected mice. So collectively, this study suggests that the magnitude of damage to albumin by oxidants, sugars, and or homocysteine impacts health span related metrics and lifespan. So as a last note, I haven't gone through why they chose to use albumin for injection into these mice. Now, albumin is the most abundant protein in blood. And along those lines, uh, in a paragraph from this study, uh, the authors noted that they can use this approach for other proteins that are not as abundant as albumin, but also abundant in blood, including immunoglobulins or glo globulins and fibrinogen. So uh, they uh, expect to use this approach to um, purify these proteins and inject these purified young and less damaged proteins in into aged animals with the goal of potentially further improving health span and longevity. Now, these are great data, but I, just to play devil's advocate, it's important to note that the mice that they used in, the, in this study, C57 black six mice, usually have an average lifespan of 30 months, 
Whereas in this study, the saline treated mice, so the controls, had an average lifespan of only 19 months. So that raises the question, were the positive effects for albumin injections related to a potential lifespan reducing effect of the saline injections? Uh, or is this a real effect? So uh, further studies have to be carried out, but it's, uh, it's an exciting study with great data. So, all right, that's all I've got for now. Uh, if you made it to the end, I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, you can find us lots of places online, including now on Patreon. Have a great day.